pleased to introduce Amanda Swindle with NAMI. And this evening, she will be presenting about ending the silence and speaking to us uh, about mental health. So again, thank you for being here this evening. She will give a time at the end if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Clay. Hi, everyone. As it was mentioned, my name is Amanda Swindle. I'm a volunteer with NAMI. NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And NAMI is a grassroots organization that focuses on education, advocacy, and awareness around mental health um, and supporting individuals who may struggle with a mental health condition and the families associated with those loved ones as well. Um, so the national office for NAMI is actually in Arlington, Virginia, so right outside of DC. The state office for Virginia is in Richmond. And then we have different local affiliates or chapters. And so tonight's presentation was coordinated through the Central Virginia affiliate. Um, but we do have um, offices throughout those three levels, federally out of um, Arlington, and then usually each state has one, and then there's local affiliates. This needs to be updated. Emma was our program coordinator previously, but as I mentioned, um, I'm a volunteer with NAMI. I'm not employed by NAMI. I've actually been working with NAMI for about 12 years now. I started when I was in college as an undergraduate student at Christopher Newport University. I got involved with NAMI on campus, and then over the years, as I got older and went through different seasons of life, my involvement with NAMI has changed and involved evolved over the years. So my primary involvement now is as a volunteer doing these presentations, ending the silence, to increase awareness and open up discussion around mental illness and mental health conditions. Raise your hand if mental health or mental illness affects you or someone you know that's close to you. And if you look around, that's quite a few hands. And we like to do that activity just to demonstrate that we're not alone. Oftentimes, if you're struggling with mental health or challenges um, or have a loved one who is struggling, it can feel very lonely and isolating. Um, but just by the sheer number of hands that we saw in this room, we know that it's very common to be struggling with mental health. Um, and so it's important that we try to open up that dialogue and try to reduce the stigma around it. Another note about the slides you guys have, I just noticed before we started that they may have been printed in the wrong order than what's going um, when I'm presenting up here. So I apologize for that. The material is all there. Um, but if it gets a little confusing in terms of orders, I, order of the slides, I do apologize. So our mental health can affect all facets of life. It can affect our physical health. It can affect how we take in information, how we process and retain information. So it can definitely affect um, individuals in the learning environment. It affects our relationships, friendships, parent-child relationships, siblings, romantic relationships, our development, physical, psychological, emotional, attendance, and just overall success or being able to achieve whatever goals or ambitions one might have for themselves. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the difference between mental health and mental illness. Also another caveat, NAMI just came out with these new slides. This is my first time doing this presentation with this new slide format. So if it looks like I'm reading a little bit more than I should be, it's because it is it is fairly new. Um, but talking about mental health, we all have mental health just like we all have physical health, right? Um, 
but poor mental health doesn't necessarily mean you have a mental illness or a diagnosable mental health condition. And the illness for mental illness is a difference in one's brain chemistry and um, the signs and symptoms of that mental health concern being persistent enough that it is diagnosable um, and is affecting for their life to the degree that they would be diagnosed with a mental health condition. Um, and so you see here at the bottom, we also refer to mental illness as mental health condition or mental health disorder. Um, and in, in this day and age, um, we're very focused on language and the power and impact that language can have on how people identify with themselves and how they identify with the world. Um, and so for me, I try to refer to mental illness more as a mental health challenge or a mental health condition because to me that feels a little bit more strengths-based. Um, but at the end of the day, it just comes down to semantics. So talking about epigenetics, oops, it's a big word for basically nature versus nurture. Um, and so developing a mental health condition can definitely be passed down through generations. It can be biological from one, from a parent to a child or maybe from a grandparent and then we'll skip a generation and go down to the child to their grandchild. Um, but a mental health condition is also impacted by our environment and what we are exposed to, um, honestly, from, from the womb when you're in utero. If you're exposed to chronic and toxic stress in utero, there is evidence and research to show that that could impact how that individual then manages and tolerates stress throughout their lifetime. They may have a lower distress tolerance because of experiencing that on a chronic level in utero. Um, and so, you know, genes and environment do contribute to the development of a or multiple mental health conditions. Um, and it's hard to say exactly within one particular individual which may play a bigger role, and more times than not, it's a combination of both. Is anyone familiar with this term, protective factors? No? Okay, great. So, protective factors, we usually refer to them um, in regards to protective factors and risk factors. Protective factors are basically things that help us function and do better in life in all areas. So, for example, if you come from a two-parent household and then your parents divorce, sometimes the divorce may be viewed as a risk factor for developing other challenges. It depends on the child, but that's just one example. Um, but the more that we're able to build protective factors within a child's life or an individual's life, the higher rates of them building resiliency so that if mental health issues do occur later in life, they're able to bounce back from it more effectively. So it improves the rates of resiliency, lowers the risk of developing certain illnesses, not just mental health-wise, but physical health as well, and reduces the risk, um, the impact of risk factors. Risk factors, other risk factors might be um, having, coming from low socioeconomic status, or um, having a physical disability, uh, learning disability, things of that sort. So these are all ways that as parents or supportive adults in a child's life, or even just as adults ourselves, can help build protective factors in ourselves and in other people. So that second one down, the second column over, celebrating interest in school and learning, that's a big one. Um, I work with children, I'm a volunteer, but I'm also a social worker by trade, and I work with children and adolescents, and I love celebrating what I call the little wins. If they do well on a test, or they do well on a particular assignment, or they're able to bring their grade up from a D to a C, or a C to a B, 
um, really celebrating those successes and those wins. This one on the right, showing them how to articulate their feelings. This is a big one, because as a society, we don't really teach ourselves to use feeling and emotion words. We say, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Fine might be a feeling word, but that's not very descriptive. It's very vague. And good's not a feeling or an emotion word. Um, and so when I'm working with kids, I have a lot of feelings charts in my office, and they tease me for how many feelings charts I have, but um, it's very helpful to, um, to build those skills of being able to accurately identify what your feelings and emotions are. And oftentimes there's other feelings and emotions under, um, like if you present with anger or irritability, oftentimes there's sadness or loneliness or hurt under that. So having the vocabulary to express that and process that is really important. That bottom corner one, create appropriate, consistent boundaries and discipline. That consistency is key. You want to be flexible enough to where you're able to go with the flow and adjust as needed, but also ensure that you have appropriate limits and boundaries. That's age appropriate. You know, the boundaries you put in place for a six-year-old are going to be different than a 16-year-old but being consistent with those boundaries while also recognizing that sometimes we have to also be flexible. Um, the one above that, teaching them how to build good coping skills. Coping skills for me, um, growing up, I don't think I had them. <laughs> it took me struggling in high school and really in college to learn that healthy coping skills were really important. Um, and entering into the workforce, because if you get into the workforce and you don't have coping skills, you know, that's just a recipe for burnout. Um, so coping skills for me are, the, the biggest one for me is trying to balance being social, because I do enjoy being social with my friends, but then having downtime at home as well, because it's important to have that rest and recovery time. Um, and sometimes I can get wrapped up in the go, go, go and making a lot of plans, and so fortunately I have supportive people in my life that know when I'm getting wrapped up in that, they'll say, it sounds like you're stretching yourself thin. Should we take a step back and maybe take a couple of things off our plate? Um, so that for me is a coping skill in of itself. Of course, exercise and remaining active um, is important. Sometimes I'm more consistent with that than others, but I do find that when I maintain that regular physical activity, it does help to maintain um, a better mood. I went on a walk today with one of my uh, adolescents that I work with for our session. We took a mile and a half walk and just being able to be out in nature um, and in the fresh air and thankfully it wasn't too cold. It was crisp in fall but not too cold um, was very nice. So we have a couple questions here. Which protective factor are you already working on with your child? And what's one that you struggle with? Is anyone interested in possibly offering their thoughts on either one or both of these questions? Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, th I think that we don't, we don't teach that as a skill necessarily. It's not in our nature. Um, and so when I work with families, that's a big thing that I work on. And I find that it's common for people to try and speak for each other and say, oh, well, he, he or she felt this way or we did this and they, they had this reaction. And instead of trying to speak for someone, and it may not be ill-intentioned, just instead of speaking for them, say, oh, well, okay, we went to the pumpkin patch. How did, like, how was that for you? What was that experience like? How did, it, how did you feel? Did you get anxious at all? Was it enjoyable? 
Um, you know, were you hyperactive? Did you have a lot of energy? Thank you. So here we have some statistics. About 17% of children between ages one and six have a mental health or behavioral health condition. And behavioral health conditions are also considered uh, mental health conditions. They're both classified under um, the DSM, the diagnostic manual that we use to diagnose those conditions. 27% of youth between 12 and 17 have a mental health condition. Half of all lifetime cases of mental illness start before age 14. And that statistic shows how important it is um, to try and recognize the warning signs if they emerge at a young age because we see at least 50% of them happen before age 14. So being able to recognize when those warning signs or those challenges are coming up and being able to explore and access the appropriate resources and supports to help your child or to help yourself or your loved one. Because this doesn't only apply to children and adolescents, this applies to anyone. Mental health can impact us all at any point in our lifetime. And another thing is, as it relates to mental health conditions, there are some mental health conditions that will persist throughout your lifetime, and there are some mental health conditions that may just apply for a certain period of time. So I like to tell the kids that I work with that because sometimes they feel like it's just going to be a lifelong challenge that they're going to have, you know, the rest of their life. And there are some mental health conditions that if you get treatment and you recover for, from them may not apply later on. Now, there are some more serious mental illnesses that would be considered lifetime. Um, but these conditions or diagnoses don't have to stick with you throughout the entirety of your life. Two times of high schoolers with depression are more likely to drop out. 17% of high schoolers actively consider suicide. And we'll touch on suicide a little bit more throughout the presentation. And then 50% of children between 5 and 18 don't receive treatment. I mentioned the DSM earlier, the diagnostic statistical manual for mental health conditions. Um, that's where these different categories are outlined and how you would go through and see what someone meets criteria for in terms of a, a condition or a diagnosis. Um, but these are some of the different categories, depressive disorders, eating disorders, anxiety, psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder, and personality disorders. So, I mentioned a minute ago early intervention is key. And early intervention in and of itself is actually a protective factor as well. The earlier you're able to intervene for someone, um, the better rates of success in terms of recovery and making progress from that mental illness that they will have. So knowing the warning signs, reaching out and responding, working with school staff or whomever your resources are in the community um, in Virginia, we have something called the CSB, the Community Services Board. Um, I don't know if Dinwiddie has their own or District 19. Um, some localities have their own and some localities share one office. But District 19 is the local Community Services Board here for Dinwiddie. Um, and they are a public mental health mental health, substance use, and developmental disability agency um, where you can go and access services and resources. So therapy, um, psychiatric medication management. For developmental disabilities, you could be assessed for waivers and things of that sort. Um, so again, not only just school staff, but what resources do you have in the community to reach out to? NAMI, we are a great resource. Um, NAMI does provide free resources and programs to the community. Um, we have different classes that you can take. Uh, there's one called Family to Family. So if you're a family member of someone who struggles with mental health condition, peer to peer, if you are someone who struggles or has lived experience with mental illness. 
um, Ending the Silence. We have other presentation programs, and these are all free to the community, which goes on to four, provide resources and support. So in talking about warning signs, these are some of the areas that you want to be thinking about intensity, duration, and distress level. How severe are the symptoms? How long do they last? How often are they happening in terms of frequency? And then distress level. How much do they impact, impair daily functioning? Um, in that daily functioning, you're looking at all facets of life. How does it impact the youth in the home? How does it impact at them at school? in the community, if they do any recreational activities. So you want to look at those different environments. And, and someone's functioning in one environment may be very different to the, to the other environment. So we're going to learn more about um, the terms typical versus atypical. For younger children, these are some examples of some early warning signs that you may see with them. Frequent tantrums um, or intensely irritable the majority of the time, that's a big one. Um, as a social worker in the work that I do, we say that behavior is communication. And that, I mean, it doesn't apply just for children, it applies for adults too, but as you're growing up, you may not have the development yet or all the vocabulary or cognitive skills to be able to articulate what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. And so those feelings and emotions come out through behaviors or acting out behaviors, quote unquote. Um, and so kids that are having frequent tantrums, that are getting frustrated very easily, um, that may not be able to follow directions, um, could be, could be. It, and again, th this is all it could be. I'm not saying Oh, the first sign of a tantrum, your child has a mental health condition. But these are just different things to think about. Talking about fears, worries, or if they're having nightmares. Uh, physical symptoms, so headaches, stomach ache, different gastro issues um, that children may be having. Can't sit quietly, constant motion, sleeping too much or too little not interested in playing with other children, or having difficulty socializing, struggling academically, repeating actions many times. And that one's also to the point where it's starting to impact, again, that daily functioning. So if you're having to check the lights to make sure they're all out for 30 minutes or an hour, and that's making your child late to school every day, that's a demonstration of it impacting their daily functioning. And then wanting, talking about wanting to hurt themselves or others. For older children, so it splits it up into the two different environments. At home, seeming sad, hopeless, empty, unhealthy sleeping patterns, sleeping too much or too little lies in making up stories, highly reactive to rejection or criticism. That's something I see a lot is um, the, the adolescents I work with being very sensitive to um, feeling like everything is their fault, a lot of internalized blame, low self-worth, unexpectedly rude or snappy. That goes to that irritability one. Irritability is oftentimes a symptom um, of depression or even ADHD. And we may not think that because irritability is that outward emotion that we see, but there's oftentimes other feelings and emotions underneath it. Isolating self, talking or joking about dying, signs of self-harm. And then at school, missing or skipping classes, academic performance declines, disorganization, patterns of perfectionism, trouble focusing, very, responds very emotionally to grades, thoughts of violence, and makes up excuses for social activities. Mia's sick. She's 
she's been complaining that her stomach is aching and she's all and she's always been a picky eater but now she barely is eating enough this has been going on for about a week ever since she came back from a close family funeral is this normal behavior or could Naomi be dealing with a mental health condition would anyone like to try and answer Could be, absolutely. Let's see what the next slide tells us is the correct answer. Yeah, so this is saying it's typical behavior. But you're right. I mean, it, it could be either way, and that's why it's important to seek out a mental health professional so that they can assess to determine if they feel like it's more situational given the loss that that family had or if it's something that could be more chronic and could be diagnosable or could be supported through therapy or other services. And it points out that it's been going on for a week. Um, so again, my, co my comment about it being chronic, seeing it happening over a prolonged period of time, and then how it starts to affect those different life domains. Logan has been picking fights at school for the last six months. He thought it was just a phase, but now he's started talking back to his teachers and has been disobedient during class. His grades are suffering as a result. Is this typical, or could Logan be dealing with a mental health condition? Ding, ding, ding. So I think the key difference between these two examples is the period of time that it was happening over. But yes, you're right. Um, looking at his the school performance, and let's see what else the school performance. Oh, and talking back, his behavior changed as it relates to authority figures. And again, it says it's worth talking to a professional to see what's going on. We're going to go through this next. Oh, actually, this goes through. All right, Kate, 11, has been avoiding her friends and saying she can't participate in social, social get-togethers, which has been going on for months now. She's spending more time in her room and keeps saying she's fine. This would be considered atypical behavior, and it actually gives some information about those different category areas that we touched on earlier. Avoiding her friends and isolating herself and from her family as well. So that's impacting her social life and her home life. It's been going on for several months, so you want to look at the duration. And then the lying, saying she's fine when it's clear she's not. Ben, 14, becomes argumentative and disrespectful to his parents and teachers when preparing for finals for the last month, which leads to losing privileges that are important to him. This is typical. Feeling stress around exam time is normal. Acting out in response to stress is typical. And if you look at the duration, intensity, and distress levels, they're all centered around this one event, which is temporary. Now, if this behavior continues past that finals time frame, then it may be something to look at a little bit closer. You've noticed that even though Audrey's grades and class attendance have stayed the same, she's changed her opinions on topics she used to agree on and has found a different friend group. That doesn't sound like a 14-year-old. What? <laughs> yeah, that's typical. Very, very typical. So adolescents and teens, as I mean, as I can remember, as I'm sure many of you can remember, constantly changing our opinion on things as we're taking in new information, getting new experiences, learning new things in school, um, finding a new friend group, group that's very typical. And it doesn't appear that the changes are impacting Audrey's performance or other aspects of her life. James has been wearing long pants and long sleeve shirts all summer long, complaining that he's cold. You've noticed that during stressful situations, he disappears in his room for a while and then returns appearing calmer. Let's 
So before we go to the next slide, I'll kind of ask this a little different. Is there any details in this example that would be a red flag for someone or cause concern and make you think a little bit harder? Yeah, so his dress during the summertime, the long pants and the sleeves during summer, and then going to his room and returning appearing calmer is interesting. I'm curious about that. What could be happening while he's in his room? So as you said, wearing long pants and sleeves in warm weather may be a sign of self-harm. Could also be self-esteem, low self-esteem. Duration, it was happening throughout the summer. And it could be impacting his social life and act outdoor activities. Anna's experienced a wide range of emotions uh, within the last week. I'm sorry. In the last week, you've seen Anna experience a wide range of emotions throughout the course of a whole day, from sad to angry to happy. When you ask what's going on, she says there's nothing, but she's open to figuring it out with you. Um, so typical behavior for a teenager. Um, and it's... There's actually different parameters in terms of providing different mental health diagnoses um, under the age of 18 because puberty and the teenage years can often mimic different signs and symptoms of mental health conditions. Um, and the mood swings um, is, is one that can get a little bit tricky. So that's why um, there's some mental health diagnoses that aren't recommended until someone turns 18. Um, so just to be mindful of that. So like we talked about in the first example, it was hard to tell if that child's experience was due to a mental health condition or if it was more situational because of the loss that she and her family were going through. And so as we mentioned, it's hard to tell the difference, but um, it's better to be on the safe side and to be cautious and to speak with your school or another professional to see if further assessment or help is needed. So, suicide a topic that is hard to talk about and probably not comfortable, but very important for us to talk about and to provide language ar around. This, the presentation may say it later, but I'll go ahead and mention it so I don't forget. If you are worried that someone, a child, adult, doesn't matter the age, is considering suicide, the research shows that it is okay to ask directly. You should be asking directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Are you having suicidal thinking? You will not plant the idea into that person's head. It's better to be direct because it helps allevi alleviate some of that stigma and lets that person know that they can talk about the hard things, including suicide. So ask the question directly. Second leading cause of death between 15 and 24 year olds. Twice as many girls, but unfortunately more males complete suicide. Um, another thing about language, you may have heard people talk about, um, oh, they were unsuccessful with their suicide attempt or they were successful. They, they died or they didn't die. I try to stay away from the word successful because even if someone does die as a result of a suicide attempt, that's, I don't think that's something that should be celebrated or considered a success. So just being mindful of language. Um, another thing around suicide, um, historically how we have referred to it as someone has quote unquote committed suicide. Um, there's also some change in language around that. Instead of saying committed, saying died by suicide, and that's to a, take suicide kind of out of that crimin, criminal behavior language instead of saying committed, like it was committed as a crime, um, saying they died, died by suicide. 
again, a personal preference, but um, just some tips that I've gotten the last few years in doing this work. 19% of teens have seriously considered suicide. LGBTQ plus community is at higher risk of struggling with suicidal thinking and suicide attempts. The number is slightly higher for black teens that have attempted suicide in 2019 to 2020. And then we see that number for the LGBTQ plus community. We touched on protective factors earlier, so now we're gonna look at risk factors. So a risk factor, this is in relation to suicide. A risk factor for suicide is having symptoms of a mental health condition or being diagnosed with a mental health condition previous suicide attempts, family history of depression or suicide, ex experiences of abuse or neglect, lack of support network, and struggling with gender identity or sexual identity with lack of support, as we saw with the LGBTQ plus numbers being much higher for that community. Some of the warning signs talking about suicide or death in a way that is overly obsessive and just pre being preoccupied with those topics, not in a way of, oh, I watched this movie and, and that happened in the movie, or did you hear about so-and-so died by suicide? Just mentioning it in of itself isn't necessarily a warning sign, but if someone is overly preoccupied or fixated on that topic, talking about not wanting to be around anymore, hopeless or guilty feelings that are overwhelming, pulling away and isolating, writing songs, poems, letter about suicide, loss of interest in things that you love, giving away treasured possessions, that's a big one, especially with pets. Um, if someone appears to be re trying to rehome a pet or pets, um, or giving away maybe like jewelry or other sentimental items to them, and risk-taking behaviors, that's another um, warning sign as well. So risk-taking behaviors, Risky sexual behaviors, um, you know, driving really fast or really erratically, experimenting with substances, things of that sort. So what to do? Reach out and respond. As I mentioned, ask directly, are you considering suicide? Don't leave someone by themselves. And um, there's now a new number for suicide for mental health and suicide um, intervention specifically, it's 988. So you can dial 911 or 988. If it's a non-life-threatening mental health crisis, express concern. Hey, I've noticed that I've, you know, I've tried getting you, um, we've had a few parties lately, and I've sent you these invites, but it seems like you've been at home a lot more lately the last several weekends. Is everything okay? What's going on? Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Or let's say it's a sibling. Hey, lately you've been in your room a lot more than usual. Um, you used to like to watch movies with the family out in the living room, and you've been in your room, and um, it seems like it's really dark in there, and I saw some letters laying around in the bathroom. Is something going on? That second one, promising not to keep a secret, is really important, um, especially for peers, like for children, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, because you want to have that trust and confidentiality with someone, but also... Me personally, I'd rather someone be mad at me or upset with me or temporarily lose that trust with them and save their life than not say anything and something happens and they're no longer with us. And then seek out the resources. So again, 911, 988, NAMI, suicide hotline. These are examples of how to start the conversation Tell me more about how you're feeling. I'm ready to listen. Can you help me understand 
I'd love to help you find a solution. And if, if the word solution seems a little bit too heavy, maybe I'd love to just help you figure this out or I'd love to talk this through. So the one below that, don't try to fix the situation, listen, and give solutions if they're open to them. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I want to vent just to vent. I'm not looking for a solution, and then other times I am looking for a solution. So sometimes offering, you know, like, hey, I have a few ideas of, of things that we can do to try and help that. Would you like those ideas now? And if someone says no, then respect that. So within your school, find who the point of contact is. If you think your child or another child you know that goes to that school, let's say your, your child's friend or um, anyone else who may be struggling, find out who the point of contact is at your school. Um, usually the school counselors are a great place to start. Um, school social worker is another good resource. Um, the administration in terms of the assistant principal, the principal, I'm sure they're really busy, but um, if available or if there's an, an assistant principal assigned to a particular grade, they can usually be a good point of contact. But definitely the school counselors and the school social worker. And it's okay to start with the teacher as well. They may not be the person who's going to take lead on the next steps or the next action steps, but they will help get you connected with the appropriate people at the school. Share your concerns. Ask about resources. And also seek... Seek accommodations or supports in the school setting. The, every school has a process that they follow that's set by the federal government um, to assess a child's needs in the educational setting to make sure that they are set up for success. So explore what resources could be put in place, either informally or formally. Are your concerns with the healthcare professionals that are involved in your child or family's life? Ask for referrals. They might know who's in network for you. Also, with most insurance providers, you can just log on to your website or, or download the app and search for healthcare providers that are in network. For me, I've never gone to anyone that's not in network because it would just be very expensive. Um, and although it can be hard to find mental health clinicians that are in network, um, it is possible. Ask about evaluations. And again, that applies to the school setting as well. If your child needs extra accommodations, there are different testing instruments and assessments and evaluations they can administer to determine what might be helpful. And educate yourself. And you're doing that already by attending this presentation to learn more. Working with the school staff, you can connect your child to the right resources sooner, so that, early, that earlier the better in terms of intervention that we talked about earlier, to make sure that they get the help they need. Building your support network through your healthcare professionals, the school, and your community. And NAMI Central Virginia also has a presentation program it's called Hope Renewed. That's specific to churches in the faith community um, and with the goal of also destigmatizing the topic of mental health within those communities. Um, so we're trying to target communities in all facets. How, how NAMI Central Virginia can help you. As I mentioned, we have different support groups, both for, parent, so for parents of youth we have mental health courses. We have presentations such as this. We have a resource booklet that you can request. There's our website, namicva.org. And I think the state is, um, I want to say namiva.org or namivirginia.org. I'm not sure if it's spelled out. So that closes out the kind of educational portion of the presentation. I'm now going to share my personal experience as someone with, um, a mental, with mental health conditions and struggles with in terms of my mental health.
So, when I think back to when my mental health challenges started, it was probably in elementary school. I remember always being connected to the school counseling office. And at the time, I didn't realize that I was a youth who was identified as needing more support than other kids. But hindsight's 2020. As I got older, I realized that's what I was. Um, and as I got older, I continued to be a student um, identified who, who was identified to need more support. I had a parent who was struggling pretty significantly with alcoholism and her own mental health challenges. Um, and so starting in middle school, I was part of a support group for students who had a parent with substance use challenges, and that continued through high school. I think my first uh, kind of acute mental health episode, per se, happened in high school. I remember freshman year, I was on the track team. I was not a runner, um, but there was one practice in particular and I don't remember why it was very overwhelming for me, but I had a pretty intense panic attack. I was hyperventilating, I was crying, I had a lot of tightness in my chest and in my throat, and I remember just walking from the track back up to the high school and really struggling to make sense of it. Um, but then my, so my mental health challenges continued through high school. I had a lot going on at home, as I mentioned, um, with one of my parents, and. Sophomore year, I, I moved from one household to the next, so a lot of transitions. Um, I had an a adult sibling who was also struggling with addiction pretty significantly. My parents had divorced by that time. They had a pretty unhealthy and, at times, violent relationship. So up until high school, there was a lot of different experiences going on that impacted my mental health and my well-being. Fast forward to college, and college just exacerbated it all and really made it worse. And unfortunately for colleges, I feel like we don't really set students up for success. We put a lot of, a lot of pressure and expectation on studying and staying up all night and high performance and being involved in all these extracurricular activities, which is great to an extent, but then again, at what expense? And for me, it was at the expense of my mental health. Um, and so I remember sophomore year, I was involved in Greek life at that point. I was in a sorority. I was involved in some other extracurriculars too, actually NAMI, NAMI on campus. And um, I was a full-time student. And then I also had a part-time job as a server at a local restaurant. And for anyone who's worked in the restaurant field, that's just a stressor in and of itself. Um, I remember one Sunday I had worked the um, after morning afternoon shift at my restaurant, and I was late for my chapter meeting for my sorority. So I remember probably driving too fast to get to the meeting, parked, sprinting through the like quad field to the building, and then getting in line for my meeting. And similar to that, after that track practice in high school, had this overwhelming feeling of panic. My chest got really tight. My throat felt closed off. I started hyperventilating. I started crying. But the way I describe the crying is not like a sadness crying, like a gentle release. It was like the only way my body knew how to expel all the stress and other emotions that I was experiencing at the time. It was like a violent cry. And I felt very alone at the time. I remember going in the bathroom, going in the stall, and I heard some girls come in for a second, and I tried to quiet myself down as much as I could because I didn't want them to know what I was experiencing. But those panic attacks and anxiety attacks continued very consistently for the rest of my college career. I remember being in class one time, and by that point, I had gotten a lot better at recognizing when they were coming on. And I literally said to myself in my head, mm, I'm about to have a panic attack. Let me go to the bathroom went to the bathroom, dealt with it for like 10 or 15 minutes, and then came back. But what, what kind of life is that to live? That's not sustainable. That's not healthy. I shouldn't have to feel the need to leave class to go deal with something like that and then to return to it. Um, I wish I knew that I didn't, 
at the time, I put a lot of pressure on myself academically, but I wish I knew at the time that I could have taken self-care and not go back to class, but I didn't even think that that was an option. Um, so through college, by my senior year, I started to see the psychiatrist on campus. I was really fortunate to be able to get in with our counseling center, so I was doing individual therapy, which I had done pretty much my whole life. I did it when my parents went through their divorce. I had done it in high school when all those other issues were going on, so I was very familiar with it. Oh, and by this time, I was in school to be a social worker, so I was going to school to do this later on. Um, and so by my senior year, I decided that medication was something I needed to bring into my own treatment plan to support my mental health. And that was a really hard decision for me because I, there was a lot of stigma. Even as someone who was working with NAMI and, and encouraging dialogue about mental health, I still felt very ashamed and embarrassed and angry at the fact that I needed medication or it was to the level where, where I thought I needed it or felt I needed it, and I, I did. I haven't looked back. <laughs> that was 10 plus years ago. Um, and for me, that moment was important because I think that was the moment of me really starting to accept what having mental health conditions meant for me um, and looking at it more as a journey of recovery and less as um, being ashamed of it and trying to truly erase that stigma, not just talking the talk but also walking the walk. And so fast forward, I feel like I'm pretty stable in my recovery. Um, I recently transitioned jobs. The job I was doing for about seven or eight years really took a toll on myself. And so now in this new job, I didn't even know I could feel this unstressed. Honestly, I feel really good in this new job. Um, so it's possible to thrive. Um, but we have to be honest with ourselves about where we are and our own experiences and build a support network around us to have those conversations. I'm very fortunate that I do have supportive people in my life. I have a partner who has dropped everything to come to me in the midst of a panic attack, who has gone to therapy with me to learn about trauma, about how my brain chemistry might be different than his, um, how to support me in those times. You know, I talked about the venting versus the solution focus, you know, just being a support, being there in the here and now. Um, and so I'm really fortunate to have those supports. And I love being involved with NAMI because I love the educational part of it, but I also love sharing my own story as someone who has struggled with mental health. Um, and for me, it's been primarily with anxiety and panic attacks. A little bouts of depression, but um, I'd say the anxiety and panic attacks have been the biggest issue I've struggled with. And for me, as I've gotten older and learn more about it. It is really rooted in trauma and early childhood experiences. So again, that's why that early intervention is so important. Um, and I mentioned that from elementary school, I was identified as a student who needed that extra support. And I, I was thinking about this on the drive over. I remember being in high school and being in those support groups with other students who had parents with substance use issues and I may not remember all the content or the material that we learned, but I remember that peer support I had with them and the support that I had with that school social worker and then with my high school counselor. I actually got reconnected with her just a couple months ago on Facebook. She's retired now. Um, and I, did a, I was interviewed for a podcast a, month, a little over a month ago, and I talked about my school counselor and how much of an impact she made on me and making sure that I was being taken care of and I learned after the fact that her and my dad were always in communication with each other. So, um, you know, that's just an example of they were trying to support me when I was a student. And at that, we're at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, that is the NAMI Central Virginia's um, phone number and email. Again, I don't work at NAMI, I'm a volunteer. Um, but they do have paid employees. Right now they have an interim ex executive director. Her name is April, and so she would likely be one of the individuals answering those emails. Um, and yeah, so thank you guys. I appreciate it. And thank you, um, Amanda. Are there any questions uh, for Amanda this evening before she leaves us? Okay. The slideshow, there are packets were on the table, so if you do not get one of those, please do so. 
I am going to draw some tickets. We have a couple door prizes this evening. Um, and we just appreciate, Amanda, your, number one, educating us, but your transparency with your story. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that takes a lot of courage to do that. Also on the table was our resource guide um, for Dinwiddie County Public Schools, which Ms. Powell, with our social workers, put together. So that resource guide has resources on mental health, on substance use, on a lot of different things that may be helpful, helpful to you. Um, so if you would like one of those, um, please let me know. But if you have a ticket this evening, we have three prizes. And I'm going to start with the bag from Sweet Frog. We appreciate them donating. There's some goodies in the bag. So 371848. Yes, it's you. All right, come get your prize. Thank you. Okay. All right. We have from um, Amazon has donated a drawer organizer for your kitchen drawer. So 371843. Anybody? Okay, I'll go again. 371850. You got it? last, and for me, the favorite, some free um, meals at Chick-fil-A. All right, so 371853. Oh, wonderful. All right. So again, we just appreciate you coming out this evening. Our next Family University will be in January. And it will be about communicating with your child. So please spread the news. We would love to have more people come out. And we hope uh, that you have a great evening. Thank you.